I know if I find you, I will have to leave the earth and go on out over the sea marshes and the brant in bays and over the hills of tall hickory and over the crater lakes and canyons and on up through the spheres of diminishing air past the black set noctilucent clouds where one wants to stop and look way past all the light diffusions and bombardments up farther than the loss of sight and to the unseasonal, undifferentiated, empty, stark. And I know if I find you, I will have to stay with the earth, inspecting with thin tools and ground eyes, trusting the microvilli sporangia and the simplest coalenterates, and praying for a nerve cell with all the soul of my chemical reactions, and going right on down where the eye sees only traces. You are everywhere partial and entire. You are on the inside of everything and you are on the outside. I walk down the path, down the hill where the sweet gum has begun to ooze spring sap at the cut. And I see how the bark cracks and, and winds like no other bark, chasmal to my aunt's soul up and down. And if I find you, I must go out deep into your far resolutions. And if I find you, I must stay here with the separate leaves. I would love to claim that poem, but it is not mine. It is by A.R. Ammons, and it's called Him, H -Y -H, it's Him, H-Y-M-N. Um, so thank you all for being here on a lovely afternoon. It's always a little bit clunky for me to talk about my art generally, but my art specifically, because you know, I make work because I have a, a deficiency of language. So if I knew what I wanted to say, I just, would just tell you what it was and like, save the you know, material cost or something. So when I'm talking about art, the best I can do is kind of gesture at some things. And so, so one of the things I was thinking about, uh, in addition to this kind of amazing poem, one of the things I was thinking about when I was making these works is a story uh, I'm going to tell you from when I was 21 years old. So I'll just give you a little, a little snapshot of this. And again, the story is not meant to be coy or sort of deflective. It's just that if I'm going to talk about art in a way to you that's not a lie, like I don't, it's not about the color, it's about why would you do this anyway. And so hopefully this story has some purchase on that question. I remember that his knuckles, index finger to pinky, were each tattooed with a letter of L-O-V-E-H-U-R-T. But I cannot recall if there was an S residing asymmetrically on a thumb. The letter's presence or absence matters. Love either hurt and did so in past tense, or love hurts and becomes a present progressive, ongoing. I never got his name, but we met under an overpass that spanned the lanes of Interstate 70 in the east central part of Colorado that might as well be Kansas. There was not a building nor a car in sight, and the overpass was a structure oddly placed and unnecessary. It was the first time I ever saw a tumbleweed, and I remember being struck at how comic it looked, bouncing down the highway that I was walking alongside of, its rendering in cartoons and cliches was exact. The sky started off wool that day and had grown only progressively darker as afternoon came. Wind was blowing hard across the highway and the tumbleweed was rolling itself into lattice work, skipping when the winds were particularly strong. It rolled and blew along until it slammed itself into fencing that was wine colored from years and rust. I wondered if future winds running the opposite direction would dislodge the brush, or if entropy and forgotten stretches of highway would attend to the matter. It was a lonely day. I took shelter under the, un under the overpass where the sky began to brood, I'm sorry, when the sky began to brood something really awful. The man with the tattooed fingers stopped under the bridge with me just long enough to ask me where I was from, where I was headed, and to recommend a shelter in Denver that served meals for free. He seemed unconcerned with the approaching storm and kept on walking down I-70. He walked away and disappeared out of sight. I was traveling with only my backpack and a tent stuffed down into the bottom of it, and I could not afford to have any of it wet and drenched, so I was prepared to remain there under the bridge until the sky cleared, even if that meant staying there for the night. The sky barked and threatened that day, but not a drop of rain fell. The clouds thought better of the empty stretch of Colorado, I suppose. They gathered themselves up and moved on. My turn from preparation to voyeurism was immediate and I came out from under the overpass and watched, as a, watched a long while as the stack of dark blue clouds also disappeared out of sight. I received the tattoo man's shelter suggestion with words of thanks 
and did not tell him that I was out there on the road by choice, but then again, maybe he was too. At any rate, I was trying to work things out for which I didn't, and maybe still don't, have adequate language. Hell bent on being not this, not that, and it was too much for a brief exchange under an overpass. I spent my early to mid-twenties working manual labor for a pittance and evaluating myself by the degree to which I withdrew and did not participate. Having nearly failed out of high school, I didn't have the grades to be accepted into college, and I certainly didn't have the money. Those years were marked by a tremendous frustration and a readiness to burn things, damn near anything, to the ground. As is the case for, for many of us, my questions about how to be in the world were pressing and felt urgent. I wasn't entirely wrong in my devastating critiques, nor was I entirely right. The hubris of youth. Uh, identifying the problem is vital, certainly, but one mustn't become too deft at it alone. More to the point, mine was the critique that is offered from an unsteady place, from a premise that hobbles. I set off on a, on a hitchhiking trip with a bag of books, because I have always preferred a bang rather than a whimper, and I was for damn sure not going to be apathetic. But sleeping in a Denver park is not easy, and sleeping sitting up in a Salina, Kansas truck stop is not restful. And there is a particular sadness in waking to a coffee mug that hasn't been warm for hours, the stupid mug that paid your rent for the night, with its almost imperceptible skim of the room's dust floating on the surface of the brown. Hitchhiking to the Rockies was not insignificant to me, but its heroism was only a seeming. It was a kind of taking swings at the taking swings at something in the dark. It was lonely on I-70, brutally lonely. Mine was anger that was only partially righteous. It was also largely fearful and misguided. My youthful indignance was one that could only understand polarities. Virga, which is the name of this black and gray painting here, Virga is a meteorological event in which there is precipitation, but because of the height of the clouds and the air temperature around, the rain evaporates before it reaches the ground, before it reaches us. Kay Ryan, in her poem by the same name, Virga, writes, quote, drought, put to rout, miles above for miles about. Virga, the painting and the meteorological event uh, overhead, seem to resist the need for polarity. They are comfortable in the tension, or maybe the balance, of a rain that never finds us, for which we can't account. This requires, I suspect, far more than the casual live in attention mantra in which we say the words but are actually on our way to ostensibly to, to the ostensible safety and comfort of the most available and convenient convenient reductionism among whatever else it requires i think it includes an attentiveness to the quiet often the silent and a growing literacy of nuance in many of these works i hope to induce some of this atten attentiveness and literacy of nuance in myself as much as for the viewer for years now, whether it is a poem, a novel's protagonist, or visual form, the question of how things are the way they are has felt particularly poignant and laden with implications. It is black, it's a black field sliding down a band of horizontal stripes, but how is it the way it is? How is it a black field? I hear a kind of desperation in A.R. Ammon's poem and I hear a willingness to account for the microscopic and the cosmological, for the very intimate and that which is more distant than our minds can calculate. At any rate, it is a brave poem. I hope to resist my default towards flimsy certainties and find myself courageous enough for the far resolutions of my own. And we can unpack what that might mean as we go. It's all yours. <laughs> okay. Thank you all for being here. Um, I'm just going to try and give you an overview of um, sort of what I construct my painting practice to be, um, what I'm interested in, and why the paintings look the way they do. Um, and then we can, uh, as Andrew and I have like time for question and answers, we can like unpack some of those things. So uh, there's a few things that I want to like touch base on is that the first thing, I'm, I'm really interested in contemplative silence. Um, I had an experience uh, as an artist in residency on Nantucket Island with the Preservation Institute where I was introduced to uh, the Quakers and uh, the, the first meeting house on Nantucket Island. And while there, I was, I was drawing in, in the 
the meeting house, and it's the, the Quaker meeting houses are very sparse. So it's white walls, wood benches, wood floor, um, nothing decorative, just just very very austere. And I had this moment where the light came in in the afternoon and it illuminated the white walls and it sort of dissipated any sense of the structure. And I was really moved by this sense because what, what the Quakers want to do when they're in the meeting house gathering is, is actually like an inward reflection. They want to focus on, it's called like the, the inner light, the spirit. Right? They want to cultivate this relationship with the spirit, with God. And it's through reflection that they, they do this. They, they don't want to speak out of turn. Um, and so I found this place to be very uh, resonant for me and what I was reaching for. And so since then, I've moved away from like, using architectural elements and, and kind of moving towards this landscape element. When you look at my paintings, I really like I want to have a sense of silence, like contemplative silence. There is there's tension in the paintings. Sometimes they might seem a little violent, like the breaking of the tree or or the boat that's on fire. Um, but it needs to feel silent because for me that silence is really transformative. It allows me to, to slow down and to think about who I am, what am I doing in the world, um, what do I want, uh, what is my relationship to having faith. And it's, it's those things that drive what it is that I'm working for. You'll notice that a lot in my paintings there's, there's like a landscape element, and it's not really about the landscape in a sense. It's, I view the landscape as being a sacred space. Partly because I'm drawing from uh, the biblical narrative of Genesis where we, we were in the garden and we we're meant to, to have this, this earthly place and to cultivate. Um, but then we, we were divorced from that. So like for me, there's a sense of being fractured, like a sense of fractured environment. And I'm trying to mend that relationship through painting. So... For instance, like the tree that's over here, the large painting on the left, you'll notice that the form of the tree is, is more dead, right? The branches don't come out, they don't have leaves. But the tree's painted in a red, like it's, it's very saturated, it's intense, it's like coming alive, right? Um, and I like that juxtaposition between the two because for me, I'm always wrestling with this idea of like faith and like holding on to that, but doubting it at the same time. And I want my paintings to feel like you're, you're being confronted with something that's, that you can kind of recognize, but you know seems beyond your reach, that you, you recognize that there's a space somewhere else. Um, part of the reason for that is, like, I, I grew up in northern Indiana, um, as Chet said, in Peru, and I, I love the winter. And, like, I absolutely love it because it's very reflective and it's very quiet. And I'm sure many of you can attest to, like, when it's really cold, you, you feel your body in a different way, right? Like, you feel like it's, it's so present. Um, but there's also this really wonderful transformation that happens when the snow kind of covers everything. And I can remember fields being covered with snow, and then, like, it's snowing, and it's obscuring the landscape, right? So you see the snow. Um, you don't see the distance anymore, but you feel it because you've been there. You know it. And that sort of obscuring but transformation is something I'm very interested in, that sort of play of light and space. So when you look at like, the paintings, you don't get like, a far horizon, typically. You can sense that the space is deep, but it's, it's kind of close. Like you're coming up to something, but it could just dissipate at any moment. And that's like how I feel about having a sense of faith and trying to work in, in my paintings. Because um, for me, painting is really a, like a spiritual practice. Like my studio is set up to be very sparse and highly reflective, keeping going what's necessary and um, allow the paintings to grow through the process. I don't try to plan anything out very much. If they do, they feel a little too forced and I don't want that. Um, 
ultimately, I really want to, I want to be affected by my paintings, and I want the viewer to feel that way too. Um, you know, it's, I have to feel my way through the paintings. Um, so if they, they need to feel evocative is what I'm saying, really. Some other things that I, I would like to point out is that you might notice there's a sense of like luminosity or glowing in the paintings. Uh, for me, that's really significant because I attach light as being a metaphor for like spirit. And so like the spirit is coming into the space to, to lighten the way, to, to illuminate, right? To reveal something. Um, Paintings are often dark because of my process. Um, I paint and repaint if a painting's not right, or I glaze, which is just transparent paint layered up on one another. And the more you do that, the darker the painting gets. Um, so if you look real closely, you can see like shifts in some paintings. Um, but uh, I want to make a reference to the book by the writer, writer um, Tazanaki, I think. I'm pronouncing it correctly. It's called In Praise of Shadows. Um, I don't know if any of you have read it. It's a, it's a book on Japanese aesthetics. It was written in the early 1900s. Uh, it's a really fantastic small book. But in that, he talks about why Japanese culture loves shadow or darkness, like the, the play of light and shadow. And it's not because it, like, darkness is negative. It's because it enhances the quality of light. And there's two moments in the book where he talks about light coming into the space and, and making the space feel more transcendent. And one of them is in a temple um, and how it's really built up very lofty so it can be very, very dark and feel like it's, it's absolutely expansive and the light reflects off certain things. And the other is being inside a home where they have these sort of concave spaces in a room and generally there's a scroll there but they also put elements of gold in there and so when the light diffuses through the rice paper of the screens it subtly reflects off the gold so what happens is there's this like really low kind of glow that happens in this space and for them it's it's like or for for the writer i should say it's um that kind of experience is so powerful right because it's only by virtue of the darkness that you, that you can like value the sense of light, right? Um, and for me, the, the darkness is sort of the unknown. And I'm reaching to understand that unknown. So I'm gonna leave it there. Awesome. Yeah, I'm, so I'm interested in ritual and how that sort of shapes our experience, right? Um, ritual really sets apart um, something that you're doing as being very significant from daily life. And when you have a ritual, you are, at least in the spiritual sense, trying to commune with something, trying to foster that relationship. And um, for me, I think about painting as being ritualistic because I'm trying to get into a certain mindset, right, that's very contemplative, um, allowing something to come to me. Um, and there is this, like, human sort of element in the paintings uh, that, you know, yeah, the paintings don't, or the, the trees don't grow this way, um, or like, you know, somebody had to have hung the, the palms from the tree or tied them to that. Um, and I think about that as being ritualistic, and I'm not so, like, I don't want to, like, have the figure in the painting, right? Because for me, I'm doing that already. I don't need to, to show you a figure doing that when I'm doing it, right? I want you to be confronted with a sense of, like, ritual and, like, try to, like, um, like understand what that is, right? Like I think there's, we do things and people throughout history have done things where they, you know, say a tree is very sacred or a place, like it's called a thin place where the spiritual world and the physical world sort of overlap in a very thin way. And, um, you know, there's something like, let's say like Stonehenge, right? It's supposed to be like a mystical place, right? Like um, people set out, they, they build things or construct the environment in a way as to like, um, mark it off as like this is special and I'm like really interested in, in those spaces and like why why do we do that or why am I so interested in this tree or this kind of tree form and being situated in this place and it um, 
can't tell you specifically. I just know that like there's there's something in me that feels like I have to like address that. Like the fire, right? Like I love having like a fire, but I get lost in looking in that. And I think a lot of people can like relate to that. I don't know, like there's something about it that's like primordial, right? We stare into the fire and we get lost and it just feels right. Something about that. And um, I want to like call those things out um, and look at them. And so it's, it's part of the reason why I make it. Um, but I think ritual is a very um, strong component because it does say that this is set apart from the everyday. And it's important to acknowledge that, at least for me. So, so there's, a, there's a film called The Thin Red Line, which is amazing. And there's a, there's a character in this film who's, I don't know, in his mid-60s, and he's kind of reflecting back on his life, and he says, all that I would have given for love's sake, and now it's too late, poured out like water on the ground. Right? It's just it's kind of desperate. I mean, so I've been thinking about that line for like 10 years, right? Because there's a sense of, well, if I'm on this side of that statement, I still have time to not have to say that thing, right? So the, the only way I would amend uh, the idea of ritual is that I think, I think this is a ritual. I, I go buy milk and it's a ritual, or I get up and get dressed and brush my teeth. So I don't, I don't, I, I want to have the right rituals, right? How can I, how can I do the things that are gonna be better than the other things I could be doing. So as it applies to any of these, any of the kind of you know, labor intensive works that I would do, like for me it's not really about the process or that kind of thing, it's, it's like I wanna know that, like do I mean what I'm saying? Like I could tell you, you know I really wanna be a good person. And then when we leave I like push Logan over. <laughs> right? But you don't know the difference, but I do. Right? And so there's a sense in which I want to I want to make sure that I'm not lying to you or lying to myself. And one way to do that is to say, well, I'm going to, do, I'm going to make this gesture that's going to require this certain kind of effort or labor, um, and then like, see if I mean it. Right? If I make a painting called Him, H Y M N, I mean, that, that could be like a cute thing to do. But like, do I mean that? And I don't know how to know if I mean it except to approach that in a certain, in a certain manner. So for me, ritual is um, making sure I have the right rituals. Yeah. I've seen a lot of work where I feel like it's just sort of stating problems, right? the, the way the world is. And on some level, like, that's necessary to address. But I don't want to like, just state what's there. Right? I want to offer something more. Like, that's, I'm interested in like, meaning and like, how do I move past these things? How do I become better? And why do I labor so much in the studio for this? You know, like, it, it, it's not a utilitarian object. Like, how do I share this with the world, right? It's, it's, I want to add meaning or value. Um, so I don't want to just state how things are. Like, like, it needs to have, like, an element of, like, realness to the way that we live, right? But I also want to offer something more. And for me, you know, that, that moment of silence or like stillness is absolutely necessary, right? Where, you know, technology and, and the way that we interact with people has become so like ex expedient and like fractured in ways that, um, like, I, I, like I teach, it was mentioned that I teach um, at Santa Fe, I also teach at another school part time. And my students have an issue like focusing and like just even communicating. And like, I just feel like I need you to just stop and like, like think for a moment just like just be still please okay be still for five minutes and then we'll talk you know um and that's what i like i i feel like needs to happen so i want to make paintings that do that and if somebody seeks fracture i would like question why do you need that like what what use is that um and if if they do if they want that then that's that's that person's prerogative but I don't want to feed into that. Right? Like I, um, I value stillness and reflection. And if I can at least impart a moment of that to a viewer, whatever their sort of beliefs or background is, then like, I'm happy.
I don't know. I mean, that was probably more directed toward Logan. I mean, his work has that a bit more. Um, you know, a thing about something like Virga, for instance, where it's like literally cut down the middle. You know, you have two, two panels that are equal and, um, you know, if anything, you know, I would maybe, I would maybe kind of like bend the idea of fracture. I don't think that's fractured. I think it's just like what it is. Right? It's what a Virga is, is simultaneous rainfall and it's not touching me right, at the same time. Um, and so for me, that's where I would kind of like turn that and say, well, can that, can that be a place where the possibility for empathy is created? You know, where I say, oh, you, you know what that's like to feel like the rain's not hitting you either? Oh, great, okay, so like, right, not to be sort of flippant about it, but there's a sense in which, um, yeah, I don't want to state the problem either, it, but I will do that insofar as it's saying, like, we're, we're in this together, right? And if it can be an empathic gesture, then I think that has a lot of merit. And it's a generative, it's a generative pointing to the problem as opposed to like a, you know, kind of like, we all know this, but let's just say it anyway. Like, I don't, you know, yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I'm really drawn to like monochromatic, right? <laughs> um, and, and like the, the sort of tonal gray area. Um, part of the reason I love winter is because it's gray. Um, if I could live in gray and white forever, I would be happy. Uh -huh. um, and, I, and for a while, I made like black and gray paintings. Like, um, and I was criticized, like, why don't you use color? I'm like, because I'm afraid. And, you know, like, I don't want it to like signify too much. And, and you know, like, for me, like, color is always a problem. Um, but I need to have it be more tonal because I need it to calm down, right? I need the, I want the color to be to be used in a very specific way. I don't want to just be like all over it. Because one, I can't control it. I'm not very good at that, to be honest. Uh, two, like, it doesn't mean anything for me if it's all saturated. It needs to have like this tonal feel. Um, but it's also because I resonate with that kind of like atmosphere. Like, um, you know, like again, like I love winter and I love when it's more tonal because there's certain elements, like when it rains, like in Florida where I'm at, and it's gray, like the greens become more vibrant all of a sudden because they're normally tonal. And I love that like, contrast where it's like glowing in a sense. Um, so I have these like moments of experience where like that has always been filtered into it. And I've recognized over time that, okay, it's that quality of experience that I need to isolate and put into the painting so that way I can really like pinpoint it and like think about it. Um, so I, you know, it's like always going to be in my work, I feel like, you know. Otherwise, like the sense of light and saturation of color loses its, its power, you know. Um, and it just makes me happy, you know, right? Uh, my gray relationship is, it's really, I mean, I only care about gray insofar as it matters to that, to that moment or to that painting. Um, you know, so, you know, for instance, Virga, um, when I'm talking about that, I'm kind of gesturing toward this meteorological event and the gray skies and the rain and um, not just that it's gray when it rains, but like what's, what's the emotional color of a Virga? Mm -hmm. right? and, and for me, it's, it's that. Um, the one on the back wall was, is kind of a different use of blacks and grays because I was thinking, okay, how can I make a painting that's almost totally stupid? You know, like it's right on the er verge of being almost nothing. I mean, it's basically like two things. It's a black field and stripes. That's it, you know. But then it's again like, how is it that way? But for that, I felt like, well, if, it's, if there's any chroma in there, it's going gonna, it's gonna to do stuff that I don't really want it to do. So it just makes sense in that situation that maybe black is the dumbest thing I could do. So I'll just like do that, you know, um, and then see if it works. Um, and by dumb, I mean... I mean, like, can I, like, how can I edit? You know, or I'm thinking of even, even if we try the little, the crown ink wash drawing. Um, again, conceptually, if I'm thinking about the crown and even if we try and what that might be, um, the kind of muddy ink wash is just what, what that kind of calls for. Um, yeah. So it's really, it's just specific to the, yeah. to the instance. Focusing in an editing, you know. Um, yeah. 
I want to gesture at the idea of weight. Right? So these things like literally aren't heavy, you know. But but for instance, this if I'm going to gesture at a sense of weight, it only makes sense that it's you know that I'm adjusting the space that way, right? So if that let's call it a horizon line. It's not. If it's edge. Let's let's erase horizon line from your from your thinking. If that edge is high, it's no longer heavy. Right, the space is sort of heavier than that object. So, but if I bring that edge down, all of a sudden that black thing gets heavy. Um, so the weight is important. The weight's important. Yeah, I think the weight's important vertically, the same way that the weight, let's say, on the white painting, is important from the surface out. Right, it's the it's maybe a weight slash accumulation. So I think if I'm, if I'm sort of gesturing at a, a gravitational pool that has that reference to the accumulated stuff. Does that, does that make sense? But yeah, I mean, I really, I do think of them sort of figuratively. So I had this, so I'll just briefly, I had this professor in grad school and I had this theory that I, as to Jerry. So I had this theory, I said, well, you know, we read right to left. No, we don't, we read left to right. Um, and, and I said, well, because we read that way, I think things that happen on the left side of a composition, I think our brains kind of process them as though they happen sooner than if they happen on the right side. So I think that's, I still hold, I still think that's true. And Jerry said, oh, no, that's not true at all. We don't navigate the world that way. We navigate it, you know, more laterally so that we're all, when we're navigating the space, we're always kind of looking at the bottom third of the world. Right, I'm not looking up here and I'm not exactly looking here, I'm sort of navigating around. Um, so I was kind of thinking about like, occupying the bottom third of the world. I thought, well, that's kind of interesting and also has a relationship to the grounding of the left side of Virga. Right? It's accumulation, it's weight, it's so. It's weight, but then it's space at the bottom. Yeah, but I think, the, I think, I think this, and I'm you know, still thinking about all this, but I think the space is what allows the weight. Right, so if I take the if I take the white and blue off, and we just have a we have a mono, we have a field, which which could matter, but I mean in the white painting, that's the reason I give it a, a framed uh, white sort of border as it were, um, to set to set it in contrast, you know, so it's not um, I don't want it to be an object of you know furry white stuff so much as I want it to be in contrast to what it's set against. It's, I feel like it's a way of trying to articulate what the space is attempting to do. Yeah. And just trying to be careful about that, you know, because otherwise it becomes sort of a field which is not heavy. It's a field. Yeah. On my answer, real quick. Uh, so, in terms of like a, um, sort of rest space, I think it's what you said. Breathing space, yeah. That, that, um, like I'm really interested in like images being kind of more simplified. Um, I've I've made paintings where they like started to get really complex, and I just seemed to like lose my way, and I felt like I couldn't I couldn't enter in that, and I needed like a certain kind of space that just seemed to limit what could be there, but that like I could could hold me, and so a lot of times like. Um, I try to paint out areas. I'm always thinking about what's the right amount of information that I need in the painting. Um, so sometimes they get really sparse, like that, the, the one up here, Beacon 2, like it's, I, for me it's like very, very sparse. Um, some of them get, get a little bit more like heavy, like the last big painting back there, Shore Unseen. Even the bottom, I mean, like, uh, you know, it, for me, the space is filled, but there's, the, the elements in the painting are, are small enough or thin enough to, that there's still a lot of space to kind of rest in between. Um, I get, perhaps this comes from uh, like, a, like my personality, because I'm also interested in like the way a person, like the way an artist is and the way that they make work. Um, like I'm really like OCD, uh, I'm like clean, like minimalist, right? If I could be as like Spartan as possible, like like my fiance and her daughter would like hate that, you know. Um, but I, I I love that stuff because it like gives attention to the thing that's there, and I don't want to take attention away from what I'm painting. Like things are like.
for me, like very specific and focused. Um, and so I feel like there needs to be a certain amount of space, of breathing space in the painting, which painting sort of dictates that. Um, the painting by the door when you come in, to me there's a lot more information that's happening on the surface. But it does, for me it doesn't feel very overwhelming. It still feels very like open in a way that like, like some of these paintings do. Um, and to me that also kind of like touches on like being allowed to be still and not like be distracted too much, but like focus. I mentioned previously that I was kind of working with architectural images. So when I was in, towards the end of my graduate school years, I was, and after working with like spiritual sanctuaries, like a, a, the monastery in Prague, the Strahov Monastery, and the Quaker Meeting House on Nantucket Island. And what I found was like, you know, I need to go to these spaces because they're significant. I need to spend time there. I need to draw an experience. And that's going to lead me to something, right? Like interacting. Like reading a book tells me something. Um, but then I realized I had that moment that I described in the, in the meeting house. And I, and I realized I don't need to paint this. I don't need to paint this space. I'm interested in the space beyond this architectural space. And it needs, it, it needs to expand out into different images. And so I, I made this shift towards these sort of natural landscape-based images. Um, and so, you know, there's repetitions of like tree or boat um, or flowers. And for me, that I'm always trying to figure out what they exactly mean. In each painting, they seem to be a little different. But um, the, like one of the biggest revelations was realizing that the sense of space and the sacred space is not contained within a building, right? It's, it's present, I just have to be attuned to it. Um, so I'm trying to like find that in the work. And it's only through painting a lot and repainting that I seem to like understand. Like I have a feeling for it, right? Like there's a sense of felt reality. Um, so it's great, like uh, I was reading this article one time where it talked about uh, eyes of flesh and eyes of fire. Eyes of flesh is to see the physical world. Eyes of fire means to see a spiritual domain. I feel like I'm always trying to like possess eyes of fire, right? To to move beyond the physical and into that. And but of course, like I can't know it when I do it. Like it's only through hindsight, right? Yeah. Like and, and painting that it, it sort of reveals itself. There's oh, death is always in the back of my mind. Like it's not that I like fantasize or like sort of fetishize death, right? It's just it's the backdrop to all existence that we share, right? And so like I like I want to make sure that whatever I'm doing is meaningful, right? Um, but I also believe that it's, it, it's not the end, like for me, right? It, it's a moment of transition. Um, but it doesn't mean that any, anything that I do now isn't insignificant. It means it's very significant. Because um, they're, they're, it's necessary that I move through this transition in the right way. Um, so I think a lot about transformation and like what that's supposed to be. Um, you know, like I'm, I'm like always thinking about that and the work does like have this and a lot of it like the tree is broken. It seems it's by all intents and purposes it's, it's dead. Like there's no leaves. The branches are pretty much gone. But then there's this like, like kind of like ring of fire that's coming to like mend it right? and like mend that fracturing. And um, I'm, in a, in a way, I'm like trying to come to terms with that, right? Like it's still, like I feel uncertain about that sometimes, right? Like um, something that I like kind of come back to that like Andrew talked about, like there's this thing that he comes back to for 10 years, this like, this line, and it's in Emerson's essay, Ralph Waldo Emerson's essay on nature, and he says like, in the woods we return to reason and faith. And for me that's like really poignant because it's like, being in the woods is, it's very intimate, it's like, kind of psychologically aware of yourself, but it's also like spiritual in a weird way. Um, and trying to wrestle with those limits. And that's what I feel like I'm doing and why like death and ritual are significant to the work is because they, they shape experience. They shape how I'm moving through the world, my relationship to it, and like what I assume or believe to happen afterwards. I hope that answers your question enough. Ultimate transformation, yeah. Um, you know, and like the sort of triangular is like a 
Axis Mundi, which is just the connection of heaven and earth and thinking about these moments that like connect. Someone, it was Enrique, someone called my practice deadpan, like in a good, in a positive way. I was like, oh, that's, that's really great. Um, I, I really, I appreciated that because what I heard in that was um, sort of an edited, like, I'm not trying to, like, I'm trying to do something and I don't, I'm not trying to do something else. So, it, so a deadpan implies to me that, like, well, they're not very sexy and they're not very, like, maybe they're, maybe they're good or maybe they're not good, but, but they're judged on different criteria, right, than if there's, like, fireworks and stuff. Not, like, fireworks, but, you know, like, <laughs> like actual fireworks. You know. um, but I think, I think the marks are a way to, like, to have a mark without it. Like, I wouldn't want someone to say, man, that's, like, a really nice mark because I just don't care about that. That's not, a, that's not a value that I have. So it's a way of kind of taking that ability away from the viewer, right? And say, well, it's, maybe it's good for other reasons, but not because of like some sort of proficiency. I think I want a different kind of proficiency, I think is, is, is why those marks re reoccur. Yeah. The, so the, the link between our work um, uh, I say one of the things that I think like brings Andrew and I together um, has to do with a sense of labor. Um, I mean, there's I think there's shared beliefs and values. Um, I think that seems to be becoming more evident as we talk. Um, but. We, one of the, even though we have di divergent paths on how we kind of approach our practices, um, I think there's a sense that like labor is like crucial to the work, that it, it, it not only like lends significance and meaning to what we're doing, but that it somehow Im imbues this like object with like more meaning. Like we're trying to reach something and we hope that it, it achieves that thing. And even if it doesn't, um, that the, the mere fact that we've done it, I think, um, like attests to like reaching for that. I think that's sort of, for me, the title of Five Resolutions. Correct me if I'm wrong, if, if you believe with that. Um, but, you know, like when I look at Andrew's work, I, I see the accumulation of time. I see like the amount of labor um, and attentiveness to like all the little stitches, the detail, right? Like, he, I mean, I think like he has a really intimate relationship with color and like texture and like shape. And um, there's a lot of like wonderful formal elements that I think like he's trying to negate, right? Um, but not and, negate, and, you know, no, I'm, I'm putting them at the service of something beyond themselves. Sure. Right? Yeah. As an end, that, who cares? That we believe that the paintings or artwork can be more than aesthetically pleasing, right? That, that, the practice can and does become more, you know, with a critical like edge, um, and and so I feel like when like when I work too, like there's some paintings that come out like right away, but it's only because like the entire history of myself painting has led to that one moment, right? Um, but other paintings like I paint over and over again until I find it's right, and and it's in that labor and that diligence of working. Um, that the painting is earned and revealed. Right? And I think ultimately for me, um, there is that sense of connection. Even if he's sort of like thinking about how do I articulate these things very clearly? And I'm saying, I'm approaching it from a feeling and I'm going to start painting. And like I have a sense, but I don't really know at the same time. Um, but the thing that unites us is that process. So one, one, uh, one uh, addition to that answer is, and like the most honest answer I think is like why I would want to show with Logan is that um, because like in all, out him, but like in a good sense he's desperate. Like he cares about stuff and he, he cares about stuff that are, that's way beyond what color is this. I mean that's important, like all oh, that's important at the surface of something, but one of the jokes that he and I have is that, and maybe I'm, I don't know, I don't, I don't want to speak for him, but I sometimes joke that like, I, don't really, I don't really like art, which is probably a bad thing to say in an art gallery. Um, but what I love is, is life, right? And to the degree that art can be at the service of that, then, then art like, has a really vital place. 
Um, and so I know that Logan cares more about his life than his paintings, and cares more about his questions than fire and color. Uh, and I love that he, I love that he's like, because that's like a vulnerable spot, right? If, if, if you just make a painting, or if you make anything, and you, and you never talk about it beyond, it's this color, and here's what I did, and if you never talk about it beyond that, then like you, you have so little skin in the game, it's like, it's such a safe position, because you haven't, you haven't said anything, except you like red or blue or something. So I love that Logan, and I mean, I aspire to this as well, like willing to put something out there and say, you know what, this is like I, I care more about like a life question than a painting, but the painting can be a vehicle to engaging that thing. Um, so I think Logan's paintings are great, but I think Logan is better than his paintings. Um, and that's about as good as you can ask for, I think. Yeah, yeah man. Go ahead. The, uh, the title of my master's thesis show was On the Poetic Accumulations of Inefficient Time Well Spent. It was like the worst title fair. ever. You know? <laughs> like totally looks bad on a postcard. But um, for me, and I think this was, like I think there are some problems in my thinking about this, but at least in 2011 when that show happened, I was thinking about the intentionality as being the, the converting factor. Um, so I was reading Brother Lawrence, you know, Brother Lawrence of the Resurrection and his dishwashing and how he did that with a kind of intentionality that, that made it more than washing the pan. Um, yeah, so I, for me it was an intentionality. It's a non, you know, it's a, it's a non-passive position. Like I could be, maybe I'll be a bricklayer, and, but like I'll choose to do that and like lay the bricks and like I chose that and so it's not, like it might be awesome because I like, I chose that, you know, with full agency and faculties. I think intentionality is the thing. I mean, it kind of, well, I could talk so much about it. That was a master's thesis, so I can like read that to you all. But I think intentionality for me, um, like it's, it's a way of re-choosing the ritual, mm -hmm. you know, as opposed to like, well, this is what I do, so that's what I'm going to keep doing. Well, it may not be the right thing to do. And how do you know? I think you know by that revisiting. Um, last thing I'll say about that is I have sometimes felt like this is a deficit in my personhood, and it may be, I don't, I, or maybe it's an asset, but I feel like I... And bad at like saying something is this way and then never asking about it again. Like I ask about it every day. Like, okay, so I think this is what I, I think this is the premise by which I'm setting up a life and I believe this thing. And then tomorrow I think, okay, it's like, do I really believe that thing? And why do I believe that thing? Right? And so, but I think that I think the good side of that is that it keeps me revisiting and reclaiming, you know, a way of being in the world as opposed to sort of passively saying, I don't know, I'll just do this. So, so that painting's called Him, H-Y-M-N. I keep not wanting, I'm gonna keep wanting everyone to know it's not like male, you know? Um, so I think for that painting, so there's this, I have, I love to find, actually I love, but I hate to, like if you're, at a, if you're looking at curtains and you find the pattern where it repeats, you know what I mean? So you have this floral, and there's a stick, and then you find the, and then you, like I can't help but find the repeating pattern and then feel disappointed. Because <laughs> right? it's like, because it's not actually a field of flowers, like you just duplicated it, and I feel like lied to and all that. <laughs> and so, so then there's, there's, a way of, there's a way of doing a painting where you sort of like pretend like you did it in a messy way. Right? Like, you, like you pretend that like the line, like, oh, it, it would look really sweet if the line went down, so I'm gonna like make the line go down or something. And all of that might be fine in other paintings, like it might be fine in the next painting, but for this one I felt like, I probably need to make this thing as like, as like true as I can make it. Um, the idea of a hymn is a prayer. Um, and for any of you who feel like you're non-religious, you'll be happy to know, um, for Martin Heidegger, one of the most important thinkers of the 20th century, for Heidegger, theology could have had something to do with theism, but it does, didn't necessarily need to have something to do with theism. For him, theology was kind of the outer limits of what we can know. Right? So it's like the deepest questions can be met in Heidegger's view of theology. So if I'm going to make a painting called him, that's sort of dealing with that, I felt like, one, I needed to make sure that I meant it, and I didn't know how to do that except just like stay with it for so many hours and see if I really 
Like, do I, is, it, is it really a prayer, or is it, is it just like an affect of a prayer? Um, and I also wanted to, so I worked on it. Sometimes it would be up, and I would be reaching for it, and sometimes it would be down, and I'd be on the ground doing it. Um, and I thought, I want to try to do this in a non-stylistic way. Like, I want to try to do it in a way that, that is less conscious of, like, oh, it'd be so sweet if the line went down like that, and it was this. And, I mean, there were some of those decisions that were made, right? And maybe that's a deficit of the painting, but, but I tried to keep it as, like, what, what might a prayer look like? Like, how, what the, how, how would that even be? Um, and the, my, my first answer to my own question was, was like that. Um, the thing, one of the things I felt like after I made it was that the, the text hymn is kind of in there in a small way. It kind of felt like a wound, like it was sort of lodged into the painting, um, which I thought was kind of interesting. I thought, well, what, is, like, what does that mean? What does that, what does the disruption of the prayer mean? What does the disrupt, disruption of the hymn mean? And I don't really know what that means yet. Um, 